that was quite pushed in. Okay, perfect. All right, well, I'd first like to um, start by acknowledging all my collaborators on this project. This is a, a huge collaborative project funded by an NSF Dimensions grant. So um, my colleagues, Colin Dale and Bob Weiss, are my collaborators and colleagues at the University of Utah. And then the work that I'll be talking about today, is this a pointer also? Yeah, okay. Um, was largely driven by Kevin Cole while he was a graduate student and then a postdoc in my lab. And he has recently started his own research group at uh, the University of Pittsburgh. And some of the work was also done by Aaron Miller, who is now uh, at the uh, Cleveland Clinic. But there are a number of people continuing to work on this project, and two of them were supposed to be here this morning, but they are in the field trapping wood rats and having car issues. So they may show up at any time. Uh, my research is focused on understanding how herbivorous vertebrates deal with natural toxins produced by plants. So most plants do not want to be consumed by herbivores, and they produce a series of highly bioactive chemicals to deter herbivory. And when I first started on this work, we focused on liver enzymes. The liver is shown here. And it's um, the largest single visceral organ in the mammalian body. And it's thought of as the front line of defense for, for incoming toxins. But if you, if you um, really think about the system, the, the front line of defense is likely somewhere along here when the toxins are, the dietary or toxins are coming in, coming into the gut and interacting with those trillions of microbes in the gut. Animal scientists have known this for decades, that microbes in the gut facilitate herbivory in our domesticated animals. So microbes in the gut turn recalcitrant fiber into energy for animals like cows. And so we ask the question, could these microbes in the gut facilitate dietary herbivory by degrading toxins as they're coming into the gut before they're absorbed into the animal host. And the system that I'm going to tell you about today consists of wood rats in the genus Neotoma. This is a fabulous group to work with. There are over 20 species of wood rats. Each species is herbivorous, and within a species there can be high levels of dietary specialization or generalization, and within a species different populations can feed on different toxic diets. So it's a really nice comparative system. And the two species that I'll focus on today are the white-throated wood rat and the desert wood rat, and I'll give you a little introduction to each of them when it's appropriate. So the three questions that I hope to cover, and um, if I get cut short, I'll, I'll talk to you afterwards. Three questions I hope to cover today are, do gut microbes facilitate ingestion of dietary toxins? Can these functions be transferred? And does the microbial community interact with the host metabolism? So let me give you an introduction to the mammalian gut in um, rodents. So most guts consist of a gastric stomach, small intestine, they often have a blind pouch for um, fiber fermentation, and in the case of the rodent, there's this large cecum, large intestine. Many herbivorous rodents have a morphological structure that precedes the gastric stomach, and I'll refer to that as the foregut. And morphologists have wondered about the function of this structure for over a century. So Kevin Cole set out to study um, the wood rat foregut to see if it housed microbes and um, what the function of those microbes might be. I should say that um, this structure is heavily keratinized, and we just did a large RNA-seq pro um, project to understand what the gene expression looked like in the wood rat foregut compared to the lab rat foregut and found nothing remarkable <laughs> after all that work. Um, so the, the foregut tissues do not seem to be interacting in a special way with the microbial community, as is the case in ruminants. But um, we did find that the foregut houses a very abundant and diverse community of microbes. So this first 
graph shows the number of live cells per gram of contents, and I have the gut here oriented in a different fashion along the x-axis, but one refers to the foregut, and you can see that there are 10 billion um, microbial cells in the uh, wood rat foregut, and that is on par with what we find in the cecum, number four, um, which is known to be an organ that houses a high density of microbes. We also found um, the signature of microbial metabolism in the production of volatile fatty acids in the foregut, and this was higher than what we're, we were seeing in the cecum. So the foregut is very um, microbially active, we did 16S sequencing to understand uh, which microbes were there and um, found a number of different phyla present in the foregut. 80% of the relative abundance was um, comprised by Firmicutes, which is um, in contrast to something like a cow, which about 30% of the microbes in their gut are in this phylum. So this suggests that the function of the foregut is different than that of a ruminant in that it's probably unlikely to be fermentation of fiber. And that's also supported by the short residence times of food in the foregut. So food moves through the foregut within a couple hours in these animals. So we wondered whether the microbes themselves would facilitate the ingestion of dietary toxins. And to do this work, we studied a population of Neotoma lepida, the desert wood rat. And in this population, the animals feed on creosote bush. Creosote bush is a very noxious um, shrub. Five to 20% of the dry matter of this shrub is locked up in phenolic resins. These phenolic resins are very complicated and made up of over 300 aromatic compounds. Many insects can't colonize this plant, but wood rats can, and some populations can feed on 100% creosote bush. So um, we studied the, uh, we did this study by looking at whether disruption of the microbial community would affect its ability to deal with uh, creosote resin. So we had um, animals that were uh, fed creosote based food and non-creosote based food, and we had animals that were given neomycin as a microbial community disruptor. And then we conducted a persistence trial. So we don't do lethal studies in the lab, or we try not to do lethal endpoint studies. We take the animals to 10% body mass loss and then remove them from the study because um, animals will starve to death before they'll poison themselves. So their reduction in food intake is our indication that they've had all that they can tolerate. So these are the results of a persistence trial that we ran for two weeks. And this black line represents two groups of animals. Um, both of these animals were on uh, diets that did not contain antibiotics, so no antibiotics on the control and the creosote chow. And 100% of our animals made it through those two weeks of the trial. When we added antibiotics to the um, animals on the control chow, we saw that some of them dropped out during the course of the experiment. So just the presence of antibiotics reduces their ability to feed on a non-toxic diet. But when we combined antibiotics with toxins in the food, none of our animals made it through 14 days of the trial. They all dropped out. We saw a significant reduction in the microbial diversity um, in the fecal community of these animals. And so these results suggest that microbial communities are absolutely critical to these animals to process these highly toxic diets. <clears throat> so we asked the question, well, what are the microbial functions that we might see in the foregut community? And we focused on the foregut here because the foregut precedes the um, place in the gut, the small intestine, where toxins are absorbed. So if microbes are going to facilitate ingestion of toxic foods, the degradation has to come before the toxins are actually absorbed into the host. Um, and I've told you about the toxins in, in um, creosote. So we took a metagenomic approach to do this work, and we compared the metagenomes in host-fed diets containing 
control and creosote diets. We uh, use the uh, Illumina HiSeq um, platform uh, with paraden reads that are slightly shorter than what you can get today. We had an average of 52 million reads per gut. And we classified the functions using MGRAS, which we heard about yesterday during our workshop. So this next slide is fairly complicated, and I'll, I'll walk you through it. Um, on the top here, we have our different gut communities. So each one of these represents a host fed either a control or a creosote-based diet. And you can see that the microbial communities sort out based on the diet given to the host. So the control is separate from the creosote. And then this is a heat map um, indicative of these different um, microbial functions that are performed. And the darker the color, the more genes represented by that function. And there are a couple of um, functions that I want to focus on, and that is uh, the stress response and the metabolism of aromatic compounds. So in the animals fed a creosote-based diet, we saw more microbial genes associated with the stress response and the metabolism of aromatic compounds. That's not surprising, given that I told you that creosote resin has over 300 aromatic compounds in it. And this is also what's seen in humans taking large quantities of pharmaceuticals. So we wanted to drill down and understand which microbial genes might be important in these responses. And we found a single microbial gene, aryl alcohol dehydrogenase. This converts aromatic alcohols into aldehydes. It play, it's known to play a role in the degradation of these organic compounds. And by looking at the flanking regions along the sequences of this gene, we found over 50 different gene copies suggesting that this um, gene was being produced by different microbes in the community. And we think that um, this compound may play a role in degrading some of the aromatic compounds like NDGA shown here found in creosote bush. We wondered uh, if it was possible to transfer these functions to other organisms. And we were inspired by all the work that was taking place in humans where um, fecal transplants were being used to treat C. difficile infections through re repopulation of the gut. And we were particularly interested in this because our, our animals, unlike humans, see feces as food. So it's very easy to give them fecal transplants. They're coprophagic. They regularly ingest their, their own feces. Let me um, uh, tell you a little bit about the natural history of the animals that we used in this study. So I told you that in our previous study, we focused on uh, the desert wood rat that feeds on uh, creosote bush, and that's shown here in the desert southwest. So the Mojave is indicated in this hatch line, and our animals in the Mojave were collected. Um, actually, the, the dots have shift, shifted a little bit. The, they were collected in southern Utah. But in um, northern Utah, there are populations of wood rats that have never in their ecological or evolutionary history seen creosote bush. Creosote bush showed up in the southwest at the end of the last glacial maximum about 17,000 years ago. And these animals in the north have no um, experience with creosote bush. So we use these as our naive um, population. And we conducted a study where we collected these juniper feeding wood rats with um, naive microbial communities. And we collected our experienced wood rats from southern Utah. And we had two populations of donors. So our experienced donors, our donors with experienced microbial communities, and our donors with naive communities. And then we collected their feces and fed them to um, the naive wood rats, generating uh, a population of wood rats with an experienced microbiota on a naive host background and a naive microbiota on a naive host background. So the only differences here are the fecal communities that were fed to these animals. And then we did another one of these feeding trials where we gradually increased the level of creosote resin in the diet over time. And I should tell you that the experienced animals can tolerate six to eight 
25% creosote resin in their diet so that they can achieve very high levels of resin intake. And um, we follow these animals over time. And the uh, control line is shown here in purple. So the animals receiving the naive microbiota all dropped out by the time they hit an 8% creosote diet. But 40% of the animals re receiving the experienced microflora remained in the trial after 21 days in the trial. So we, we radically improved the ability of a naive animal to feed on a novel creosote diet just by doing a fecal transplant. So I want to uh, switch gears right now and tell you about um, a transfer that we did in a different system of wood rat. So this, this is the white-throated wood rat, and it lives in scenic Castle Valley, Utah. It primarily feeds on a diet of cactus. Cactus is very high in a natural compound called oxalate, and oxalate is like cellulose in that it is only degraded by microbes. And this wood rat consumes a huge amount of oxalate per day, um, 150 milligrams per day. This is far more than humans can tolerate. And our study showed that its microbial community can degrade up to 95% of it, and that this is adjusted as we increase the level of oxalate in the diet the microbial community is able to maintain this degradation level. So if we feed the animals 1% oxalate or we feed them 6% oxalate, 95% of the oxalate gets degraded. <clears throat> we did some 16S um, inventories to look for oxalate degrading microbes in the system. And this graph shows the relative abundance of the microbial communities across the gut. And um, each microbial, each gut uh, section represents a very different environment for microbes. So you can see that in the foregut, the potential oxalate degraders were dominated by um, lactobacillus, and that was, that was true across the gut. And we found other rare taxa, and I won't talk too much about that today other than to say that most of the rare taxa was dom dominated by oxalobacter. And as its name implies, Oxalobacter is an oxalate specialist and um, is known for its ability to degrade oxalate. Oops. Um, we also looked at the ability of these organisms to degrade oxalate in a functional assay. And those data aren't shown here, but I can tell you that uh, several species of Lactobacillus, as well as uh, some of the other species, had a high ability to degrade oxalate. So can this function be transferred to other species? So in this case, we took the microbial community from our white-throated wood rat, and we transferred it across 25 million years of evolution into lab rats. So these animals are very distantly related, even though they're both called rats. And then we measured the lab rat's ability to degrade oxalate before and after this fecal transfer. So in this graph, I show the um, the amount of oxalate on the y-axis, and these first two bars show the amount of oxalate consumed. The open bar is before we did the microbial transfer, and the closed bar is after. And you can see that the lab rats were willing to consume more oxalate after they received a fecal transplant from the white-throated wood rat. And then if we look at the amount of urinary oxalate that was excreted, which is a measure of microbial activity in the gut, because in order for it to come out in the urine, it has to be um, absorbed across the gut into the animal and then excreted in the urine. And before the transfer, we saw more urinary oxalate excreted compared to after. So there was significantly less oxalate taken up by lab rats after they had received the um, transfer from the white-throated wood rat. So we're wondering if, if we could transfer this function to other species besides lab rats. And um, uh, this has particular relevance for humans because oxalate is found in many of the foods that we eat. It is, the, uh, it is a precursor for kidney stones. 80% of kidney stones are formed from calcium oxalate. And so you might imagine that we might be able to um, uh, 
<laughs> put some of these bugs into a prebiotic and transfer it into the human gut because I don't think the fecal, the fecal therapy will work in this case. <laughs> And this is something that Aaron Miller is working on right now at the Cleveland Clinic. All right, so in the last 10 minutes, I'll talk to you a little bit about whether the microbial community interacts with host metabolism. So um, for this part of the talk, we're going to return to that fecal transplant study that I talked to you about earlier. And the main take-home message here is we have the same host background, the naive host that has never seen creosote in its ecological and evolutionary history. And the main change that we've made is to give them different microbial communities, microbial communities from animals with experience to creosote, and microbial communities from animals that are naive to creosote. So experienced microbes and inexperienced microbes. And um, what we first noticed was that the was the urinary metabolites of uh, these animals was different. So what you're looking at here is the um, urine of our naive animals with the naive microbial community. And you can see that it's kind of this milkyish brown color. And um, my uh, former grad student, Kevin Cole, was giving a talk recently, and I was in the audience, and he said, this was the most exciting day of my graduate career <laughs> when, <laughs> when I collected this urine. And, and I remember this because he ran into my office with a rack full of urine, you know, shaking urine in my office. So why was it so exciting? Well, here's the control transplant animals. And the stuff that comes out in the urine is indicative of the things that are absorbed across the gut and then um, processed through the kidneys. He was so excited because this, the naive animals, so same genetic background, but a different microbial transplant, were producing a urine that was a vastly different color. So I, I hope you can see that in the back, yellowish white on this side, brownish red on this side. So we call this metabolomic imaging by ecologists. We thought that, 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 that this must represent different metabolites in the urine, and in fact, we did real metabolomics, and this is a principal coordinates analysis of that. And you can see in the purple dots the metabolites that are produced by the animals um, with a naive microbial community versus the metabolites that are produced by animals with an experienced community. So very different metabolites. We weren't able to identify many of these, which is the case in metabolomics. You can't usually identify the things you're seeing but they're definitely producing different metabolites. So we really wondered how the microbiome would impact liver gene expression. I told you at the very start of the talk that the liver is the primary um, place that uh, toxins are degraded. So we did uh, gene expression analysis of animals being fed control versus creosote diet. And the Venn diagrams that I'm going to show you are the genes that are upregulated on the creosote diet. So genes induced on a creosote diet. So if we look at the naive transplant animals, there were 42 genes induced on a creosote diet, 42 genes in the liver induced on a creosote diet. And if we look at the animals that had the experienced transplant, about half as many genes were induced. So there's much more liver activity in the animals that are naive with their naive communities compared to the animals that are naive but have an experienced community. So less work on the part of the liver suggesting that fewer toxins are getting into the host body and needing to be metabolized. So let's look at some of those genes. So in the case of um, the animals with uh, a naive transplant, Many of the genes that were being turned on were detox genes, so cytochrome P450 genes, aldoketoreductases, and glutathione S transferases, suggesting their liver was really working hard. When we look at um, the experimental transplant genes, there, were, there, there was one gene that's related somehow to detoxification. Um, and when we look at the overlap between the genes that were expressed in both cases, there were about 10 P450 genes. So all in all, it seems that the animals with the 
um, experienced microbial transplant, their liver is not working as hard as the animals that have um, a naive transplant. Sorry, this is in the wrong place. Now I just want to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about um, what we're doing right now and what my crew is out trapping wood rats for in the future. And that is to test this idea of phylosymbiosis, that host phylogeny impacts microbial community similarity. So we just published a study on um, the iconic pica, and I should have a real picture of a pica here to show you, but pikas are um, in the rabbit family, and they, they occur in North America. They typically live on talus slopes. And in this work, we studied the sequel communities of pikas across a geographic region. And this is the host phylogeny shown here. And we compared that to microbial community similarity. And these three populations on the top, Montana, Colorado, and Utah, they're similar in that they have a typical pika diet that consists of a lot of different forbs and grasses. Um, the Oregon pikas, well, at least until uh, last week or the week before, fed primarily on moss. So over 60% of their diet consisted of moss. And I say until a few weeks ago because they were in the Columbia River Gorge, and it's my understanding that the temperate rainforest in the gorge has now burned to the ground. So um, there's probably no moss for the pikas to feed on there right now. But what we found was that these, uh, this community was dissimilar from the other communities. And there's a particular genus that was found in the Oregon pikas that was not found in the other communities. And we heard about this genus yesterday too, Melania bacteria. So this is thought to degrade fiber and moss is extremely high in fiber. And this um, bacterium may be responsible for allowing these Oregon pikas to feed on a diet so high in moss. So we saw an interesting concordance here between host phylogeny and microbial community similarity supporting this idea of phylosymbiosis. But um, Seth Bordenstein, one of the proponents of this concept, says, well, you need to remove the effects of diet. So in this previous study, these we didn't control for diet. These animals were feeding on their natural diet. So we're now doing a study with wood rats where we're collecting a variety of species of wood rats. And as I mentioned in the beginning, they're nice because within a species like Neotoma lepida, you can have populations that feed on different diets. So we're collecting the fecal communities from these animals when we first capture them in nature. And then we're bringing them into the lab and we're putting them all on the same rabbit chow based diet to see um, if this concordance between phylogeny and microbial similarity persists even after we remove the effects of diet. And these are the species we're targeting, and I'll just um, tell you why uh, we're targeting these, and that's because we can find different species that feed on the same plant type. So we've got Lepida and Bryanti that both feed on creosote. We've got Lepida and Stevens Eye that both feed on juniper, and um, we've got cactus feeders in there as well. So by the end um, of this collection, we'll have replicated diet across a number of populations and species, and we'll be able to do this nice comparison to see are the effects of diet stronger than the effects of phylogeny? At least that's the hope. So I'd just like to come back to the beginning to say, uh, to summarize a bit on what I've told you. So um, we think that microbial communities are essential for uh, herbivores to process toxic diets. It's very curious that these functions are easily transferable, and that's another question we're studying in the lab. What facilitates the transfer of these communities? Is it the application of a selective agent in the diet? In all these transfers, we've applied these toxins to the diet, and that may be what allows these microbes to establish in an already full community. And we can see that the uh, microbial community is interacting with the host, and we're still trying to understand the nature of those interactions. 
And with that, I'd like to um, uh, thank my funding sources, uh, additional people that worked on this project. If there are any undergraduates in the audience, we are um, recruiting graduate students. The University of Utah is a great place to do graduate work. So if you're interested, come talk to me about that. And I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. So um, we're, we're collecting in the wild, and we'll collect a month later. We're also doing a two-week collection, but we did a preliminary study, and it seems that four weeks is long enough to see the individuals, the, the community similarity of individuals converge more so than when they came in from the wild. So when we look at those peak away plots, the dots are spread around, and after, over time they um, get closer together. And we're trying to decide whether we analyze the two-week period as well, because you know it's just, it's just more sequencing, more money. Yes. So the question was um, to look at whether the, the community rebounds after these fecal transplant. And in the case of the oxalate study, we followed animals for nine months. And um, we didn't give them oxalate during that nine months. And the function persisted after nine months. It was uh, diminishing. And the microbial communities were changing. They hadn't gone back to the original, but they were definitely drifting in that direction. It seemed like the, um, the indication we gave for the function of the microbial community in adapting creosote was to convert those hydroxyls on those uh, aromatic moieties to aldehydes um, and presumably breaking the aromatization and detoxifying. Is there any indication that there might be energy usage from those compounds? Once you get up to something like 10% of diet, it seems like that would be uh, even more beneficial. I'm just curious if there's any indication of that or if this is purely the detoxification. Yeah, so the question was, uh, is creosote resin used as a substrate by the microbes? And um, I don't know what we would look for. Do you have an idea of what, what, how we would measure that? I mean, ring breaking, if you're going to matter about ring breaking, otherwise, probably I still play one. Yeah, no, we would love to know that, but we didn't look for that. Is there an association between coprophagy and a specialization in the diet? Uh, we'd love to know the answer to that question. So whether there's an association be between being coprophagic and dietary specialization. And you would be surprised how hard it is to keep these animals from being coprophagic. <laughs> We've tried putting funnels, like dog funnels, on them, and they, they don't tolerate that very well. Other people have tried by building one-way um, cages so that the animals can't turn around. But um, th th they're, they're really adapted to, to this habit. So oftentimes, they are coprophagic while they're sleeping. They have midnight snacks. And so you really can't let them you know, bend around like that. Do you have uh, examples of across species. Uh, I'm an anthropologist, and a friend of mine who works with Hadza pulls uh, seeds that bound through uh, baboon guts and uh, in, the, in the dropping. So I just wonder if there's if, if you get cross species sharing these bacteria. So I've witnessed pikas collecting the feces of other animals, and certainly in wood rat middens you see, um, you see lots of things, including feces of other animals. And this may be a way to rapidly expand one's diet by acquiring microbes that are useful in a new environment. I mentioned that creosote feeding is new to these animals and that it's only been over the last 20,000 years, and it may be microbes that facilitated that transition and then allowed the host to evolve its own mechanisms to it. In the back? Oh, last sorry, question. do you want to go on? We'll do one last question. Okay. I was just wondering, your, uh, your lab question, you said in the wild, there are 
Yeah, so the question is, um, what's the contribution by fungi? And we don't know the answer to that. Well, thank you. Thank you.